Hello everyone, my name is Patsy Iwasaki and I want to thank you and welcome you to my presentation, Deadly Encounters, Social Responsibility Past and Present. I really wish I could be there in person. However, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to keep us in lockdown and limits our travel even more than one year later. And we're very fortunate to have the technology that allows us to share and collaborate across the world. My deepest regards and sympathy goes out to you all who are dealing with this crisis and who may have experienced illness or loss of loved ones due to the virus. My topic of discussion today introduces the current violence and discrimination related to the COVID-19 pandemic against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States today and compare them to a deadly encounter in the past through the lens of Hawaii immigration from Japan 130 years ago. I'm thankful for this opportunity to share my research and teaching practices with you despite being thousands of miles away. So let me begin by saying aloha to all of you. Aloha is Hawaiian for hello, hi, how are you? It's a greeting, much like hola in Spanish. And let me give you another greeting called the shaka sign, a hand gesture of friendship that like aloha has many meanings such as hello, right on, thank you, take it easy, all very positive. A gesture that even our 44th president, Barack Obama, who was born and raised in Hawaii, often used to link, often used to link him to the 50th state of the United States. I want to thank the One Asia Foundation, the University Complutense Madrid, and Dr. Sun Lopez Varela for kindly inviting me to take part in this course that seeks to bring diverse perspectives and increase global understanding. I'm so committed and passionate about global education, cross-cultural and multicultural studies, and about building cross-cultural relationships. This COVID-19 pandemic affecting everyone around the world is truly showing us all that we're more similar than different. Although we come from many different backgrounds, cities and countries and speak many languages, we truly are one human race living on one single planet Earth. I strongly believe that relationships, especially cross-cultural relationships is a universal global truth. The COVID-19 pandemic has directly impacted everyone on this planet and has claimed millions of lives. As I prepare this lecture, the number of deaths in the United States has reached 500,000, a half a million people, the most of any country in the world. My topic today will focus on the deadly encounters in the past and in the present. The COVID-19 virus is deadly and hate crimes are also deadly. I'll be discussing the increase in racist and xenophobic violence and discrimination against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders related to the pandemic in the United States and compare them to a deadly encounter in the past. While many were celebrating the Lunar New Year and the 2021 Year of the Ox in February, Violent racist crimes were being committed against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and reported in news media such as the BBC in London, NHK World in Japan, and the New York Times in the United States. Because the virus has been linked to the originating in Wuhan, China, some people called it the Chinese virus, and resulting xenophobic violent behavior have been targeting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. New York City alone had an 867% increase in Asian hate crime in 2020. Let me play this short video from CNN. I'd like you to know beforehand that there are disturbing images and words on this video. Tonight, San Francisco police arresting a man for allegedly assaulting an Asian man because of his race. It comes after an alarming rise in unprovoked violent attacks against Asian Americans amid the pandemic. I warn you that some of the video that you are about to see in this special report is upsetting. Kyung Law is out front. Happy birthday, dear grandpa. Turning 84 was a milestone for Wicha Ratanapakti and his family. Oh. The San Francisco grandfather had just received the vaccine and stayed healthy through the pandemic, walking for an hour in his neighborhood every morning. 
It was on his walk when an unprovoked attacker ran across the street. How did you find out what happened to your father? The officer answered the phone, and then he told us, like, they found him, got assaulted. <laughs> he got an um, injury very bad about his brain breathing, and he never wake up again. I never see him again. A 19-year-old suspect is charged with murder and elder abuse, but Ratana Pakti's family calls it something else. This wasn't driven by economics. This was driven by hate. Ratana Pakti's death is part of a surge in reported attacks against Asian Americans during the pandemic. In Oakland, a man walked up behind a 91-year-old man and threw him to the ground, one of more than 20 assaults and robberies like this one. In Oakland's Chinatown. In Portland, more than a dozen Asian-owned businesses in recent weeks have been vandalized. These incidents are not new. In New York, the MTA retweeted this video of what they called racism. This man sprayed Febreze at an Asian-American on the subway at the start of the pandemic, prompting an NYPD hate crime investigation. Asian pieces. Oh, my God. A coalition has tracked more than 2,800 anti-Asian hate incidents between March and December of last year, like this one at a California restaurant. Before the election, this man invoked President Trump. Trump's going to you. Need to leave. The then president's words, China virus, Kung flu, have lasting impacts, says Professor Russell Jung, who tracked those 2,800 hate incidents through Stop AAPI Hate because no governmental agency would. Mainstream society doesn't believe that we face racism and we needed to document what was happening. So we're just offering like our support to the community. I Okay, let me get back to. Um, okay, let me get back to my uh, my my slides here after that disturbing video. Uh, as mentioned in this video, what is really disturbing is that the crimes are being often being targeted at the defenseless elderly. The crimes against the 84-year-old male Richa Ratanapakdi and the 91-year-old male in the video both happened in California. The escalation has prompted President Joe Biden to sign an executive order against hate crimes. As I was watching and reading about these uh, terrible hate crimes, it made me immediately think and compare what is happening now to another xenophobic incident that occurred over 100 years ago, 132 years to be exact. On October 28, 1889, Japanese immigrant Katsugoto was lynched and killed because he fought for the rights of Japanese sugarcane plantation workers. Now you must be thinking, how did a Japanese man end up in Hawaii way back then? Japanese immigration to Hawaii has been a research focus for many years for me, so kindly let me explain. Here are the Hawaiian Islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, with Japan on the left and North America and the United States on the right. It's such a very tiny collection of islands, so some world maps might not even have its location. It is believed that Polynesians for the Marquesas Islands in the South Pacific use their long distance voyaging canoes to travel over 3,200 kilometers to settle in the Hawaiian Islands at about 400-500 AD. The islands remain isolated for over a thousand years. In 1778, Captain James Cook an English explorer and his crew were the first Europeans to visit Hawaii and called the islands the Sandwich Islands after one of his sponsors, the Earl of Sandwich. They were welcomed by the Hawaiians who traded items for provisions. On their second visit in 1779, back from the Pacific Northwest, Cook arrived during the festival dedicated to the Hawaiian god Lono. So he was welcomed as Lono, who was associated with agriculture, music, and fertility. But Cook and his men overstayed their welcome, and when a crew member died, the Hawaiians realized they were not gods, but mortals. The crew left, but returned after a week out at sea because of a broken mast. mast. Relations were tense when Cook and a group of his men came ashore. 
A small ship was stolen, a high chief was killed, and the Hawaiians turned on Cook, and he was killed in 1779. In turn, the crew fired cannons at the Hawaiians, and about 30 were killed. After the ships returned to England, news about the Hawaiian Islands in the middle of the Pacific started to circulate around the world. About 15 years later, in 1795, a great Hawaiian warrior, diplomat, and leader conquered and united the independent Hawaiian Islands under his rule. He was King Kamehameha and he established the Hawaiian Kingdom, which maintained its independence as a sovereign nation for about 100 years. A century later, many countries were interested in gaining political and economic access to the Hawaiian Kingdom, and they tried to do so through imperialism and colonization. Russia, England, and especially the United States were interested in Hawaii. As you can see from this map, the Hawaiian Islands are in a very strategic location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The United States wanted a Pacific military base and economic opportunities. And the United States did indeed succeed. A military base was established at Pearl Harbor on Oahu in 1887, and it became the most important American naval base in the Pacific and home to the U.S. Pacific Fleet. I want to share one interesting, another success for the uh, United States came a few years later. A group of American sugar barons and businessmen successfully overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy with a coup. The overthrow of Hawaii's last queen, Queen Liliokalani, came in 1893. A year later, the Republic of Hawaii was established in 1894 under President Sanford Dole, one of the leaders of the coup. And four years later, in 1898, Hawaii was annexed to the United States as an incorporated territory. I want to share one interesting story between Hawaii and Japan. Back in 1881, King David Kalakaua traveled all around the world, to Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. His travels brought the small island nation to the attention of world leaders, but also sparked rumors that the kingdom was for sale. King Kalakau also visited Japan for two weeks. Many say he was trying to deflect American ambitions towards Hawaii and possibly place Hawaii under the empire of Japan's protection. So he proposed a marriage between his niece, Crown Princess Kailani, with Prince Higashifushimi Yorihito. While the proposal fell through, it's uh, interesting to think about the possibilities if Hawaii had come under Japanese rule. In addition to being the first king to circumnavigate the world, King Kalakaua's global tour also had an economic purpose. He was being pressured by sugar plantation owners to find an additional labor to find additional labor sources for the extremely lucrative sugar industry that was booming in Hawaii. Growing, harvesting, and processing sugarcane was very labor intensive. Here is King Kalakaua seated in the middle, with Japanese officials to the left and right. Standing in the back are members of the king's delegation. Why was the sugarcane interest? Why was the sugarcane industry so lucrative for the sugar barons? The Reciprocity Treaty of 1875 was a free trade agreement between the United States and the Hawaiian Kingdom that guaranteed a tax-free market for Hawaiian sugar in exchange for economic privileges and the naval base at Pearl Harbor. The immigrant labor force that was successively recruited from Asian countries such as China, Japan, Korea, and the Philippines is what created the multicultural cultural society of Hawaii that we have today. This slide features the original government contract agreement between the Hawaiian Kingdom and Japan in 1885. It was called Kanyaku Imin in Japanese and First Ship Immigrants in English. It's signed by King David Kalakaua and his Minister of Foreign Affairs, Walter Gibson. I was able to take this photo when I made an appointment at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ropongi, Japan, a few years ago. This started the mass immigration of Japanese to Hawaii. There are 26 shiploads of contract laborers under the agreement with King Kalakaua and the Hawaiian Kingdom. By 1924, there were over 200,000 Japanese nationals in Hawaii from many prefectures in Japan. As this photo shows, many women labored in the fields as well. Immigrants also came from Portugal. Because of their European background, they were assigned to supervisory positions. They were called Luna, 
and were often on horses, keeping the workers in line. The first ship of government contract laborers was called the City of Tokyo, and 944 Japanese nationals arrived in Honolulu Harbor on February 8, 1885. Katsugoto, who I introduced at the beginning of the presentation, was aboard that ship, and he was 24 years old. I wrote a graphic novel about him titled Hamakua Hero, A True Plantation Story, because he was the victim of a high violent hate crime, a victim of the push and pull factors of immigration around the world then and now. What was happening in Japan at that time that would push the Japanese like Goto to Hawaii? After the Warring States period, Iyasu Tokugawa successfully united Japan and established the Tokugawa Shogunate, which lasted for 265 years. In order to exert control over the country, the Tokugawa established a policy called Sakoku or seclusion. No one was allowed to leave the country and no foreigners were allowed into the country except for a few specific ports. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry's fleet, under orders from the United States to establish trade with Japan, <coughs> arrived <coughs> at Tokyo Bay. Trade with China was very successful, and the United States wanted to enter the Japanese market. The powerful cannons on the ships were pointed at the city, and the Japanese government grudgingly agreed and signed the Kanagar Treaty in 1854 that opened up trade between the United States and Japan. The Japanese government then made the significant decision to embrace Western culture and ideology, and this was the beginning of the Meiji Restoration. Named after Emperor Meiji Mutsuhito, who ruled from 1868 to 1912. He was just 15 years old when he became emperor, and his reign was called Enlightened Rule. The Japanese government wanted to take part on the world stage and close the gap in all areas technology, government, transportation, education, business, and the military. Scholars were sent out to attend universities around the world and learn from different countries. Foreigners were hired and brought in with their expertise. They looked to England for guidelines in government and architecture, Germany for education, medicine and science, the United States for military expertise. The Japanese went from a medieval society and agrarian culture to an industrial modern power in such a very short time. The Japanese government and family industries like Mitsui and Mitsubishi financed all of these expenses. It was quite expensive to send out scholars and to bring in experts from all around, over the world. They overextended themselves financially, which became an economic crisis for the country. What does a government do when they're in trouble? They enact taxes. The government applied mandatory taxes to the people. At this same time, there were several years of poor rice harvests. The combination of the poor rice harvests and taxation caused 370,000 residents to lose their properties between 1883 and 1890. They sold their properties to pay the taxes. Thus, for the Japanese government, the labor recruitment call from Hawaii was a form of economic relief. The workers would also need to send 25% of their income back to Japan, thus supporting the economy. For the Japanese, after being isolated for hundreds of years, many caught what was called a broad fever. It wasn't a physical illness, but a fever to see what's out there beyond the confines of Japan. Recruiters advertised fields of gold and get-rich-quick dreams. At first glance, you can understand why so many Japanese would want to emigrate to Hawaii. The Japanese economy was in a recession, rice harvests were poor, and many residents thought they might do better in Hawaii. Most of the labor recruits were second or third sons. However, the reality for those first Japanese immigrants was definitely not fields of gold but rather extremely poor living conditions. And a labor contract with meager pay, working for 26 days a month, 10 hours a day, that consisted of years of backbreaking labor intensive work by clearing land, digging ditches, planting, fertilizing, weeding, and harvesting cane. After his arrival in Honolulu, Katsugoto was contracted for three years to the Soper Wright and Company Plantation along the east coast of the Big Island of Hawaii, near the town of Honoka'a. However, in my research about him, I learned that he was not 
your typical recruit at all. He was the oldest son in his family, set to inherit the family name and property. He was educated, and he had quite a bit of English proficiency. While working in the prefectural office in Yokohama, he was also a writer and editor of the Yokohama Boy Kinippo, translated to the Yokohama Daily Trade Report that was published by the Yokohama Chamber of Commerce. He reported on information about foreign relations and commerce. He was an up and coming professional in Yokohama, one of the most thriving growing cities in the world and a Japanese port where foreigners could live and trade. And he gave it all up to go to Hawaii. Why? Perhaps he had caught a bad case of a broad fever. He was working in the port of Yokohama, seeing scholars leave for exciting assignments all over the world and seeing experts from around the world arrive. Since he wasn't part of that elite group of scholars selected to go abroad, perhaps this was the only way he thought he could see the world. When his contract ended after three years, Goto enterprisingly opened up a general store in Honoka'a in 1888, near the plantation where he worked. He became the first Japanese store owner. Prices were competitive, and he stocked Japanese groceries and merchandise from Oahu that made the Japanese immigrants feel closer to their homeland. Goto's general store quickly prospered. It soon became a gathering place for the fledgling Japanese community in Honoka'a and Goto became a leader for his community. This photo was probably taken when he opened his general store. It is the only known photo of him. Because he spoke English, Goto, be Goto became the li liaison between the Japanese laborers and plantation management. He advocated for improved working conditions and wages. He facilitated medi mediation and served as the interpreter. When the Japanese workers ran into a problem, they would seek out his help. On October 9, 1889, several Japanese men were blamed and fined a lot of money for a fire in the cane fields, although there was no evidence. The men turned to Goto for help with this difficult situation, and he met with them on the sugar plantation to help them. Even though he knew he was being targeted by the plantation owner and associates because they believed he was the instigator of the worker unrest. When he left the men at night upon his horse, he was lynched and his head and neck were severely injured. Then he was hung on the telephone pole in town and he died. He was found hanging on the morning of October 29, 1889. This was just four years after his arrival in 1885 and he was just 27 years old. Lynchings were common toward Black Americans in the South during this time period, but this was unusual in Hawaii. Dr. Gary Okihiro, American history scholar and author of many books, said, A lynching is not a murder, not an execution. It is an act of terror. It is to teach the living a lesson, and that's why bodies were left. It was a lesson for those who ruled that they were in control, and it was a lesson for those who were subjects subjected to that rule that they should not cross that line or aspire to be equal to those who rule. That's a very harsh le lesson, and that is terrorism. You inspire fear on the part of those dominated to be quiet, to listen, to agree with the rulers. An investigation of the murder was conducted. Arrests were made and a trial was conducted. It was a sensational case as Joseph Mills, one of the leaders of the lynching, held many important positions in town. Four men were arrested and convicted of varying degrees of manslaughter and sent to jail on Oahu from four to nine years. However, in the end, only William Watson would be the one to fulfill his four-year sentence. Thomas Steele escaped through a window of the jail and left Oahu on a ship bound for Australia. William Blabin slipped out of the prison gate and boarded a ship to San Francisco. And Joseph Mills was granted a full pardon and restoration of his civil rights by the Republic of Hawaii. Many felt the sentences were unjustifiably light. However, many have also pointed out that for this time period, it would have been normal not to do anything it would have been easy to just forget about this incident. That the lynching received media attention, arrests, a trial, and sentencing was a testimony to the social responsibility of the criminal and court system at the time. Thus, I'd like to bring this presentation back to what's happening today. 
social responsibility requires that the COVID-19 related hate crimes blaming, blaming Asians and Pacific Islanders for the pandemic needs to be documented and justice needs to be sought. Those responsible must be held accountable. Vicha Ratanapakdi, 84, with Thai background, died after being thrown violently to the ground, as you saw in the video. Antoine Watson, 19, was charged with murder and elder abuse. The 91-year-old man of Chinese background in the video was pushed to the ground. Yaya Muslim, 28, has been arrested. And Anol Quintana, 61, of Filipino background, was slashed across the face and required 100 stitches. This was not in the video. As I was finishing up this presentation, I was able to join a Pointer Institute for Media Studies session via Zoom called Race in America. Where is the coverage of anti-Asian harassment and violence? Pointer Institute is a nonprofit journalism school and research organization in Florida. The timely discussion was about the disturbing lack of coverage about these anti-Asian hate crimes in the media, that Asian Americans are often still seen as foreigners both Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. That people are using the fear of COVID-19 as a weapon against defenseless elderly Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Using Asian Americans as scapegoats for the COVID-19 pandemic. There needs to be greater action and accountability, such as the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus plans to hold a hearing soon to discuss this topic. And there needs to be solidarity that we must join together, not only as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but from a universal global approach. We must build awareness and get the stories out in the media. And we must choose our words wisely because words do matter. There is a need for a more equitable and just society. Asian lives and others needed it in the past, as in the case of Katsugoto, and Asian lives and others need it now in the present. There are possibilities of hate crimes all around us. There are possibilities for deadly encounters all around us. But it goes beyond Asians and Pacific Islanders. This applies to any marginalized segment of society, whether it be race, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, physical ability, language, immigration status, and there are so many others. Any movement or change towards a more equitable society requires social responsibility. All of us, no matter what color, shape, or form, need to practice social responsibility to help create a more equitable and just society and world. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your kind attention, and I hope that we may have the chance to meet again as we celebrate global cross-cultural relationships. Mahalo nui loa, which means thank you very much in Hawaiian. Hawaii features diversity in its people and land. My last slide features a riveting Kilauea volcano here on the Big Island when it erupted two years ago. Thank you so very much.